For the past two decades, the Peel District School Board in the west end of the Greater Toronto Area has run a program that assigns police officers to high schools in the region to, quote, create a safe learning environment in those schools. Such programs have been controversial elsewhere, with, for example, the Toronto District School Board voting late last year to end a similar program. But a recent report for Peel came to the opposite conclusion. Linda Duxbury is the author of that report. She is a professor at the Carleton University Sprott School of Business, and she joins us now in the nation's capital for more. Linda Duxbury, it's good to have you on TVO again. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. Thanks for inviting me. Not at all. Welcome back to the program. Let's go through this. <coughs> what is a school resource officer? Well, if you, if you uh, look at the stereotype, it's officer-friendly. Uh, who is in there making friends with everybody. Uh, but a school resource officer uh, in, in Peel's particular situation is a sworn police officer who is assigned to a high school uh, on a full-time basis to uh, try to develop a safe learning environment, relationships with the students, uh, et cetera. So the, the, they're sworn police officers, though. And, and what do they actually do to try to create that safe environment? Well, that was the first uh, problem of our research because when you actually try to find out what they do, it's really hard. Uh, and so we spent quite a bit of time actually identifying. They spend uh, their time on 20 different activities. We divided them into two categories. They're either proactive community uh, policing, uh, which is designed uh, to prevent problems from happening, or it's reactive enforcement type policing, which responds to uh, problematic situations after they occur. They also either uh, spend time developing relationships, uh, gathering information, or they spend time using their skills and training. So they do a lot of different things. And for the schools that they are in, how many officers would there be in any one school at any one time? So Peel's program is pretty unique, and I think it's a very well-designed program. So they have two officers job-sharing two schools. And the beauty of that is there's always an officer available who's familiar with the principal, the vice principal, the layout of the school, knows the students. And it's also wonderful because the students see the same two officers over a two-year period and develop relationships with them. So two officers share two schools. But they don't spend all their time in the schools. So, you know, I, I've been following the controversy in Toronto, and there seems to be this impression that they lurk around the schools. But these officers are responsible not just for the schools, but safety in around the catchment area around the school, so the community around the school. And does it cost the school more to have them there, or are their salaries already paid by the police service, and therefore it doesn't? <laughs> well, they're played by the police service, which is, again, fairly unique. I know communities in Canada where they've got schools that they deem to be in problem areas where the school board pays the salary of the officer. But Peel School Board pays a lot of money, almost uh, just over $8 million a year, closer to $9 million, uh, actually paying the salaries to keep those officers in the schools. Do you know how long they've been in the schools in Peel? Well, th th and it, this is what complicated our research, but they've been in the schools for 22 years. So huh. really hard to do a before and after when they've been there forever. And everybody, uh, you know, I, I suggested, well, hey, why don't we take them out of a few schools just to see so we can compare. And they're, oh, my God, no, you know, we, we want our officers here. Gotcha. How many, or have you got a sense about what percentage of the schools in Peel Region would have this program in place? Well, that's, again, what's unique. Every single high school in the region has a full-time officer assigned to it. with full. So each officer has primary and secondary responsibility for two different schools. So every single high school. So that, again, is different from Toronto, different from Ottawa, different from every other community, where, in fact, you would have one officer in charge of, in some, in some communities, one officer has 15, 20 schools that they're administering, which is really hard to build relationships when you're spreading yourself that thin. Or in Toronto, they assigned officers, I believe, to half the schools in the board. I see. Okay. I'm holding in my hand here a copy of your report, Assigning Value to Peel Regional Police's School Resource Officer Program. Uh, yeah. Who commissioned this report? 
So uh, it was commissioned by SHRC, which for most people who aren't academics, that's Social Sciences Humanities Research Council. So I'm an academic, all of my colleagues are academic, so we applied to SHRC to do a study on the sustainability of police in Canada, and we got that funding, and this is an offshoot of that funding. Okay, now as you have seen, uh, different school boards have come to wildly different conclusions about the advisability of having this program in place. So I want mm -hmm. to understand why you came to the conclusions that you came to, which is that the presence of these officers makes the school safer. So how, how long have I got to answer that question? Because <laughs> I would probably walk you through. I have, we used a multi-method longitudinal study. We collected, we did interviews, we did ride-alongs, that's ethnographic data. We did surveys with, we, ha, we had the officers actually so committed to the project that they recorded what they did uh, in terms of those 19 activities every 15 minutes of their time for five months. We have amazing data and I guess I would say that all of the data that we collected there was not any evidence that it had a negative impact and all the evidence pointed to the same direction that in fact having those officers there for a multitude of reasons contributed to a safer learning environment and if you feel safe you're more able to concentrate you're more able to focus on your studies you're more likely to graduate and uh, that has tremendous value in a society like Canada where education is actually critical to future job prospects. So just so we're clear about this, there was absolutely no ambiguity at all at the end of this very exhaustive study that this program wasn't top notch. Um, absolutely none. In fact, um, you know, you you collect different types of data. It's it's uh, called triangulation. That's the academic lingo for it. And you do triangulation because you want reinforcement that your ideas, uh, th that your, your results are sound. And as I said, we collected five different types of data. And the most powerful thing we did was that we collected it over time. It's really hard to evaluate a, pro a program if you don't have a before and after. And hmm. so that was particularly challenging because as you said, 22 years, how do you do a before and after? Right. But what we did was the grade nines come from grade eight catchment schools in the Peel region, and those catchment schools do not have a full-time police officer assigned to them. They move into high school where there is a full-time officer assigned to them. And so we looked at them right when they came in from grade eight, so in September, and then uh, in February, March, after they'd completed a whole term. And so we have this before and after of, uh, and we, we looked at a lot of different indicators that we would expect would change if the officer made a difference, either positive or negative. When we went into this, you know, we were open to the idea that perhaps there were issues with officers in schools, that there were some positives and some negatives. But what we found was it didn't matter how we sliced the data. Even, yes, there are some students in our sample who didn't, don't like the police, but even they felt safer with the police around after five months. Well, let's just do our dil due diligence here. I'm gonna go through a quick ch checklist with you. You did talk to students, okay. right? How many? We only talked to eight students. Uh, now, teachers? And then they go, oh, uh, we did not talk to any teachers because the teachers, so if you look at how this problem is, a uh, program is administered, the people who have the most contact with the uh, school resource officer, actually it's not even the principal, it's the vice principal that's in charge of running uh, the school. And so we talked to the principals, the vice principals, guidance counselors, social workers at the school, but we did not talk to teachers. We only talked to eight students because the other thing, uh, academics has some rules in place. So when you're dealing with youth, 
And when you're dealing with human subjects, you have to complete ethics, and you have to do an ethics protocol. We had to do ethics for Tri-Council Ethics, which is for the university, and we had to do ethics for both of the school boards, which means that we had to get uh, consent for interviews, and that's extremely challenging to no, do. No, I appreciate that, so but then you know you're setting up yeah. your critics of this study to say, because of course Toronto came to the opposite conclusion, right, and got rid of this program. We'll talk more about that in a second. But, but the critics yeah. will say, wait a second, you talk to eight students and no teachers, and how can you say that you have a, a really good sense then about how effective this program is? Well, because I surveyed 660 students at two points in time, and I can track how, how uh, stressed, anxious they were, how much difficulty they had sleeping, whether they were being bullied, whether or not they were, had been physically assaulted. All of those things I could measure, and I could see, I could measure that at two points in time. And I would say using valid measures is uh, valid, reliable measures that are psychometrically sound. I would put that against any interview with uh, people when we don't know how they interviewed, what questions they asked, who was in the interview sample. I know exactly who was in my sample. I picked the sample carefully. Okay, let's do a comparison now from Peel to Toronto, which of course came to the opposite conclusion and decided to get rid of their SRO program. Uh, they cited a survey in Toronto that they took saying that too many students felt intimidated by the officers and some even felt targeted by the officers and after a you know hugely controversial public debate uh, they decided to get rid of this program why do you think the experiences in toronto and peel which are after all right beside each other would be so different well first of all let me just establish very clearly i'm not an expert on toronto However, my understanding is, first of all, Toronto only has it in some schools. Peel has it in all schools. The second thing is I've tried to find the research. So I, my research is available on the web. My report's there. You've got it. You held it up. I haven't been able to find the Toronto research. I haven't been able to find what measures they used, how th who they interviewed, what questions they asked, etc. Uh, then, you know, if, if I look, I guess I would say if the students are intimidated by the police, then why don't we work with those students in the police to try to establish a better relationship? Because taking the officers out of the school is not going to do that. That's, well, I guess that's what I would say. Okay. We, we, we are told uh, frequently by critics that black students in particular are disproportionately suspended and expelled from schools. Did you check to see whether or not students in marginalized communities in Peel might feel differently about the presence of the police in their schools versus those who aren't in marginalized communities? So we, so we selected our schools with great care to represent the diversity of the population within Peel. We had two urban grant schools, two schools that were located in one middle class neighborhood and one school that was in a fairly wealthy neighborhood. In three, maybe four of our schools, uh, the majority of the students, the vast majority of the students were racialized. So what the data represents is the attitudes and experiences of a diversity of students. So we didn't pick on any, you know, this study, if you go back in time, this study started long before Toronto reared its ugly head, okay? This study was not to see, and our purpose and our goal was not to see, uh, you know, what is the experience of racialized students in high school? Our experience, our, our goal was to determine the value of putting a program like that in place. Because the problem is, is police across our country cost the country a lot of money. And so there is a whole need now to establish the value of what you're doing. If you start looking at what's going on across Canada, they are cutting proactive community-based policing. 
which many officers and many academics would say is the kind of policing that's really got value. That's the kind of policing where you establish relationships and trust, which are essential, not just for the black community, but for all of us. You know, officers have a position of authority in our, in our society, and we have to be able to trust them. So proactive community policing is really important, but the more the more you put proactive policing in place, the more bad things don't happen. And so how do you establish the value of a program that stops people feeling uh, you know, afraid, stops bullying, stops? How do you put a cost to that? So that's what we were doing. We were not, our purpose was not the same as Toronto's at all. No, I, I appreciate the, uh, the conundrum that you find yourself in there. So I do wonder whether yeah. or not you can therefore come to the conclusion that the Peel Police Service apparently has a better relationship with the African Canadian community in Peel than the Toronto Police Service apparently does with the African Canadian community in the 416. I can say nothing about the Toronto program. I have no data on the Toronto program, but I can say, and so I don't use the term better or worse than Toronto. I try not to comment on Toronto, but I can say that the, the SRO program in Peel seems to be meeting its goals of relationship building, preventing bullying, cyberbullying, gang activity, drug activity, fighting, assaults, and building positive trusting relationships between the police and the community that they serve. And in this case, a big part of the community that they serve is in fact the students and the administrators in the school, as well as the catchment area around the school. Uh, I want to thank Linda Duxbury for coming on TVO once again. She's a professor at the Sprott School of Business and for uh, getting us up to speed here on her uh, study on the value of school resource officers in the Peel District School Board. Thanks so much, Linda. Thanks so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.